Our text this morning is from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 9. Matthew, chapter 9, verses 35 through 38. I'll be reading from the New International Version. It says, Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. And when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Father, we thank you for your word to us. And now, Lord, by your Holy Spirit, speak to every heart. Stir us, quicken us, encourage, strengthen us, O God. Let your word go down deep into our hearts that it might find fertile ground there and produce a harvest in us and then through us to this lost and needy world. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. I I need to finish my story from last week. I I heard from several of you, uh, and they said, uh, uh, you didn't tell us how that turned out at the McDonald's, okay? And so uh, as I began preparing for this morning, it dawned on me, you know, that's, I think I do need to finish the story. And in case you weren't here last Sunday or you need to be reminded of the story, let me kind of share it with you again uh, how that uh, about two weeks ago now, I was, I had an appointment over in Dayton uh, and at the seminary, Dayton United Theological Seminary. And I uh, uh, got there early. And, uh, and by the way, I, as some of you know, that's, that's part of my trademark. I'm, I'm, I'm always early. Whenever I'm late, it's because Beth is with me. And uh, just kidding, just kidding. And Valentine's Day is coming up here too. And I, no, we we have a good time with that. Well, never mind. I'm not even going to go any further. But I got to the McDonald's, and it was on the edge of, D- of Dayton. Uh, it was across from a high school uh, that was letting out, uh, it seemed to be, or there's a lot of activity, a lot of cars and there, people walking and stuff. So on, and I went into the McDonald's and thought, well, I've got some time, a little bit of time to, to kill before I have to be over there. So I ordered a coffee, and I think I might have had a Big Mac or something. I can't even remember what I ordered. But as I went inside, of course, you know what a McDonald's looks like. You've been in, even when they remodel them, they still look like a McDonald's. Uh, but as I went inside, I, I immediately became aware that this something was different here. And there were a lot of young people behind the counter and and cooking and waiting on people and washing tables and stuff like that. Uh, But but what got me, what surprised me was that these young people, uh, one in particular, caught my attention uh, that I could not tell if he or she was a he or a she. Uh, And, and, you know, uh, it... It got me, and then I got to looking around, and I thought, "Oh my goodness, uh, this is different." And uh, and I I was I sat there, and I was eating my my burger or whatever I had, and uh, and as I was watching, this one young man kept walking by my table. I I, I don't know if he was a young man or not. I think so. Uh, he had a lot of makeup on, and. Uh, uh, and, and just his uh, mannerisms, the way he was acting and things, uh, and yet the way he was walking was different. I mean, I, I didn't know. I just couldn't tell for sure. And I began to realize that probably he was, uh, would consider himself transgendered. Um, and so uh, as I was watching this situation in front of me, the Lord spoke to me, and he says, I want you to tell him that I love him. I want you to tell him that I love him. And I said, oh, Lord, I got my mouth full now. I just can't do it. I just, uh... 
And the Lord, and then the guy would walk by me again. And the Lord said, tell him. Tell him that I love him. I, and I fought with the Lord. I, I got to tell you, I wrestled with that. I, I thought, oh, what am I going to say? How can I say this? Finally, I got it all figured out in my head. I thought, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say, excuse me, excuse me. Uh, I, the Lord wants me to tell you that he loves you, that God loves you. Well, once I got it all figured out, what to say, I waited, and then the young man disappeared. He went into the back area, um, and I didn't see him come back out. And then I was sitting there thinking, I was up to the plate. It was my turn at bat, and I whiffed. I missed. Now, just to make it even worse, I remembered in that moment what the word was that the Lord gave me for this year. And it was the word love. It was the word love. See, I, I, don't, I don't believe in coincidences or accidents. I believe that when you give your life to the Lord... Even, even if you don't give your life to the Lord, I believe the Lord's working all the time, everywhere, all around you. But when you give your life to the Lord, there's a better chance you're going to realize some of those everyday miracles are happening. Those are those divine appointments. And I had a divine appointment. I, don't even, I can't even tell you what my appointment was over at the school that day. But, because the only thing that sticks out in my mind was that young man that I hope I'll see someday again, but I missed. I, I missed an opportunity. I missed, I, I missed my assignment. And then it even occurs to me, I missed his assignment, his opportunity to hear that he was loved by God, that the one who created him loves him unconditionally. And I had an opportunity to speak the truth into this lie-infested world. And I blew it. I missed it. Maybe you can relate to that. Maybe you can't. I don't know. But, but you see, that, that's what it means to be a witness. We're talking about friendship evangelism. We're talking about evangelism. And evangelism is simply proclaiming the truth, declaring the truth in a world uh, and in people's lives that are in the grip of Satan's lies. We have an opportunity to just say something as simple as, do you know that you are loved by God? That's the truth. Whether I feel like it, whether I agree with it, whatever my, my preference, my background, my experience, that is still the truth. That's the truth of God. That's the truth of God's word. They are loved by God. You are loved by God. And we have an opportunity. And we have a call to just tell people that they are loved by God. And, and, and you know, we don't have to argue with them. We don't have to debate. It's not a debate. It's not, it's not trying to persuade them of anything. You know, it's something about the truth. that the, it, it, the truth has its own persuasion. The truth calls to the deep. The truth speaks volumes. And, and all we do is the simple truth. You are loved by God. Whether you feel like it, whether anybody who treats you that way, whether you've been hurt, whatever your background, whatever you've been, you, oh my gosh, you need to know you are loved by God this morning. And how hard it is for us to speak the truth in a world full of lies, a world full of confusion, a world full of deceit. But that's our call, folks. Where that goes, I don't know. That's really not up to me, necessarily. Our call, my call, is just to speak the truth. But you know what? I was focused on me. 
I was chowing down on my Big Mac or whatever it was, my fries, and my focus was on me and not on God's heart and certainly not on God's love. And I let God down. Uh, I did not let love win that day and in that occasion. But since that's my word for the year, the Holy Spirit has told me there'll be more bats, <laughs> there'll be more stepping up to the plate, that there'll be other. And I told him, I said, Lord, I, I won't whiff the next time. I won't swing and miss the next time. The next time I'll do whatever you say to do. I've determined in my heart. And he's already given me opportunities to do that. And I've done that since that occurrence two weeks ago. Next time there's a divine appointment, Lord, I'll tell somebody. I'll, I'll obey whatever you say to do. You see, this is not a whole lot different from what Jesus was telling the disciples in Matthew 9. Jesus had compassion, it says. He had compassion. He saw the, the people uh, that he was with and speaking to as harassed, vulnerable, helpless sheep without a shepherd. And he had compassion for them. Compassion means that they, that, that endure, they, to endure suffering with, to empathize with, to feel with. And he felt with those people as harassed, helpless sheep without a shepherd. He felt what they feel. And he proclaimed the good news to them. He told them the truth. And he healed the sick. Our text this morning tells us what Jesus saw. And, and, and what he wants us to do. A similar passage is in John chapter 4, verse 35, where Jesus literally said to the disciples, Open your eyes and look at the fields, for they're ripe for the harvest. They're everywhere. The harvest is all around us. And Jesus said, Ask the Lord of the harvest. The workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest to send out more workers. That's what we're doing this morning. In Proverbs 29, 18, it says that without a vision, the people perish. Our vision, uh, what we are visualizing, what we're seeing is what God is seeing. The fields are ripe unto harvest. We're seeing what he sees. We're seeing his will. Oh, it's by faith. We're not, we're not seeing and unfold. The reality hasn't, hasn't hit all the way. But we are visualizing what God is showing us by his spirit. I appreciated what Shelley shared at the beginning of the service this morning. You know, that, that's a visualization. This generation calling upon the name of the Lord. What, what, is, what is God's will? What is God's will for you? What is God's will for the unsaved friends and neighbors and family? What, what is God's will for them? I can tell you. I know exactly. You know exactly. It says in Second Peter that it is not God's will that anyone should perish, but that everyone should come to a saving knowledge. It's not God's will that anyone should perish. Are people perishing? Oh, yeah, they're perishing all the time, everywhere. What is God's will for our church? Again, we've been talking about evangelism, evangelism, three parts of evangelism, simply some sow, some will water, and some will harvest. But listen, they're all three vitally important. You don't have a harvest unless there's been some sowing and some watering. Let God use you is what I said last Sunday. This morning, I want to I explore the story. I'm going to have to do this quickly. But I want us to take a look at the story of Jonah. Most of you may be familiar with Jonah. Jonah is a great example of this. In verse 1, the very first verse of that book, the book of Jonah, it says that the word of the Lord came to Jonah. The word of the Lord and the will of God are the same. The word of the Lord came to Jonah. Jonah was a prophet in the northern kingdom of Israel. They were in conflict with the hated Assyrians. Uh, the capital of Assyria was Nineveh. And where did God tell Jonah to go? 
He said, go to Nineveh and preach against it because their wickedness has come up to me. Go and call them to repent. Probably one of the saddest verses in the whole Bible, I believe, it's, I think it's in Jeremiah twenty two thirty, 30, where the Lord says through the prophet, he said, I looked for someone to stand in the gap so that I did not have to destroy the city or the land or the people. But I found no one. That's got to be the saddest verse in the whole Bible. God was looking for someone who would stand in the gap who would pray, who would give, who would go. And he said, I found no one. He says to Jonah, go to the great city of Nineveh, preach against it because its wickedness has gone up to me. He was calling them to repent. Verse three, what did Jonah do? He packed his bags and went the opposite direction. Tarshish is over, or I'm sorry, Nineveh is over there. He got on a boat down at Joppa, and he went that away. Not only that, but Tarshish is on the other end of the Mediterranean Sea. He went as far away as he could, tried to go as far away as he could in the opposite direction. On board the ship, in verse 4, it says that at sea, a great wind was sent by the Lord, and a violent storm came upon them and upon that ship to the point where they were ready to, the, the ship was ready to break apart. Does the Lord send storms? That's what it says. The Lord sent the storm. I tell couples when I'm doing premarital counseling, but I tell people in a lot of different situations, listen, there will be storms, okay? <laughs> Count on it. There will be storms. Whether you're a Christian or not a Christian, all God's children have storms. There will be storms. But if the stor storms don't have to drive you apart, the storms can drive you together. The storm can drive you to the Lord. Not every storm is from the Lord, though. We need some discernment on that. Sometimes Satan sends storms too, by the way, to destroy the work of God. So does God send storms? Yes and no. <laughs> How's that for an answer? Yes, he does. Sometimes when we step out of God's will and we flee his presence and we willfully disobey, since we live in a fallen world, that is at war with God and God's people, sometimes those storms are to tell us and remind us we're out of God's will and we might want to turn around. We're going in the wrong direction. And sometimes those storms are to get our attention. But I also got to tell you that sometimes the storms that we encounter are because we are doing God's will in a fallen world. Remember those early brothers and sisters in Christ who were marching into the arena in Rome to face the lion and the wild animals? They were going to their death, not because they were out of God's will, but because they were in God's will. And they were paying the price. So does God send storms? Yes and no. God will oftentimes use storms in my life as a way to drive me deeper to do a more necessary work in my heart. He does. But again, not all storms are from the Lord. We need discernment. The storm, this storm was from the Lord, though. And it was so violent that everyone's safety was threatened. The ship was about to break up. And where was Jonah? <laughs> he was below deck asleep. In fact, it says deep asleep. Can, can you sleep and have peace when you are fleeing from the Lord? Yeah, you can. Jonah did. There is such a thing as a false peace. Maybe this morning you know that you may be out of God's will or somehow you're willfully disobeying God and you're thinking, hey, I'm fine, I'm okay, no big deal, nothing bad's happened to me yet. There is such a thing as a false peace from the enemy. Just like there's 
sin provides a temporary pleasure. There can be a temporary peace from the enemy and from the world. Where was Jonah? Well, he was in the bottom of the boat, fat, deep asleep. You see, we, we can go to sleep through justifying our sins and by denying and suppressing uh, and plugging our ears. Lord, I don't hear you. <laughs> and we're la, 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 you know. And ignoring the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Romans 8.1 says there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. No condemnation. But there is conviction. And I hope you know the difference between conviction and condemnation. Condemnation comes from the enemy. You and I don't have to put up with that. But conviction of the Holy Spirit? Yeah, we do. Because it's because of God's love that he convicts us. Well, Jonah wasn't listening, and so he sent the captain of the boat, captain of the ship, down to wake Jonah up. You know, if Jonah's not going to listen to the Lord, maybe maybe God will send someone to wake him up from his sleep. The sailors up on deck when Jonah got there were busy casting lots to find out who was responsible for this calamity that they were facing. You see, those sailors were pagans. They were, they were superstitious. There had to be somebody that they could blame for all of this. They were facing their own death, and they wanted somebody to blame. They were casting lots to find out who it was, and it fell to Jonah. Do you understand that that sometimes our actions or our inactions and our disobedience will leave others vulnerable? Sometimes because of our of our disobedience, it's gone down to the next generation and to the next generation. Do you, do you understand that that our sin is not just? I mean, yeah, it, we have to own our sin, but but make no mistake. Sin affects those around us. That's why we need to be salt and light and love in this world that is perishing. Jonah was responsible for this for this uh, storm that was upon them. The lot fell to Jonah. His sin was revealed. Uncovered, And listen, sooner or later, our sin will be. There is no such thing as a sin that can be hidden in God's universe. Sooner or later, it will all be brought into the light. You can't run from God. You can't hide from God. You can't hide your sin. So what is Jonah going to do? He's responsible. Well, he's, he, I, I don't know what Jonah is going to do, but I know what I need to do. We need to repent and bring our sin to the cross. Confess it. Own it. We are responsible. And our sin is affecting other people. I forgot to tell you a story. I was going to tell you a little story about a pastor, a friend of mine, and one of the first churches I pastored up in northwest Ohio, Pastor Bob Kinney. He's since gone on to be with the Lord. But Pastor Bob uh, in that church, he was my predecessor in that church, but he retired into that community. Bob had a good friend. His good friend was not a Christian, but they were good fishing buddies. And they would fish all the time. Well, when you're a pastor, you only work one or two days a week. So he had a lot of time to go fishing. And Bob, Pastor Bob went fishing as often as he could with his friend. And they talked about all kinds of stuff, fishing and hunting, and, and, uh, but they never talked about the Lord. One time after this had been gone for a few years, and they were good friends, close friends, but, but Bob knew his friend did not know Jesus. And Bob was dropping him off after one of their fishing times, and, uh, and uh, as he Pulled away from the house. He didn't even get a block away. And the Lord said, Bob, turn around and go tell your friend about me. Well, Bob, like me, he said, oh, I can't. My mouth is full. I got a Big Mac and I can't. The 
The Lord persisted. Finally, Bob turned around and went back to the house. His friend met him at the door and was kind of surprised to see Bob pull back into the driveway. And, and he said, what, uh, what's going on? And uh, Bob says, you know, he said, the Lord's told me I need to tell you about Jesus. I need to, tell, I need to share with you my faith. His friend stood there and he said, you know, I've, I've been wondering why you haven't told me. I've been waiting all this time for you to tell me. That day in, at the living room couch in that little house there in Melrose, Ohio, Bob led his best friend to his best friend, to Jesus. What do you do with your sin? You take it to the cross. The sailors, they, when they saw the lot went to Jonah, what are we going to do? Who are you? <laughs> Why did you bring this storm onto us? Jonah said, I worship God. I worship the God who made the heavens and the earth, and I'm running away from him. And the sailors, oh, no, you brought this on us. What do we do now? Jonah said, well, pick me up and throw me overboard. The storm is my fault. And listen, the first thing, if you want to take care of sin, the first thing you do is you have to own up to it. Confessing it. See, that's the essential key to coming back to God, is you first of all have to own it. The sailor said, you know, finally they came to the point where they thought, oh, okay, well, you know, we're going to be guilty of this man's, of this man's blood, and they, they gave up and threw him overboard. It's amazing. It says that the raging sea grew calm. <laughs> That must have been something to see. But the Lord had prepared a fish, provided a, a fish, or some say a big whale. Uh, and actually, the word that's used there could have also been translated sea monster. Created some sort of a, God had, had prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah. And inside, Jonah was inside that whale or that fish or that sea monster for three days and three nights. In chapter 2 of Jonah, it tells us what Jonah was doing inside of that fish. He was praying. Maybe you heard the funny story about the atheists and the Christian who were talking about the Bible, arguing about the Bible. The atheist said, do you really believe that Jonah story? Do you really believe that Jonah was swallowed by a fish or a whale? Do you believe that he lived on that? That is scientifically impossible. That's the most ridiculous story uh, that I've ever heard. Do you really believe that? The Christian said, yes, I believe it. The atheist said, tell me how. How is that even possible? The Christian said, well, I don't know. When I, when I get to heaven, though, I'll ask Jonah. The atheist said, well, what if Jonah's not in heaven? Well, then you can ask him. After three days, the Lord commanded the fish. Jonah was vomited up onto dry land. In chapter 3, verse 1, it says, The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. You know what? I'm glad that verse is in there. Because I need, I'm Jonah. I need second chances all the time. But the Lord gives second chances all the time. Well, to make a long story short, Jonah went to Nineveh. He obeyed the Lord this time. He repented and went to Nineveh and preached. The people and the king, lo and behold, repented. They humbled themselves. Jonah, after preaching, uh, went up on the hill outside of the city, uh, found some shade under a vine and a gourd there. And he was sitting down, waiting and watching and hoping that God would destroy the city. Instead, God destroyed the vine. 
Instead of destroying the city, God destroyed the gourd. You know, sometimes God does that. He doesn't always do what we want him to do because he's trying to get to something in our heart and God was after something in Jonah's heart. Jonah was selfish. In fact, skipping all the way to the last verse of the, of the book of Jonah, Jonah was angry with God. He said, I knew you were compassionate. I knew that you'd give in. I knew that you were, you were loving and good and kind. I knew you were slow to anger. That's why I didn't want to go to Nineveh. I didn't want those Ninevites to get saved. By the way, in the Old Testament, sometimes we get this strange notion that the Old Testament is full of, is, is, is God is a, a God of blood and guts. God is angry and killing everybody and destroy. No, no, right here in the Old Testament, Jonah says, I knew, God, you are good. I knew that you are compassionate. I knew that you were slow to, I knew that you were gracious. We always think God in the Old Testament is mean and angry and God of the New Testament is love and, and uh, wonderful. And No, no, in the Old Testament, God hasn't changed. God confronted Jonah's heart. In verse 10 and 11 of the last chapter, he said, Should I not be concerned about these people? Shouldn't I? 120,000 in the city who don't know their left hand from their right hand. And God says, shouldn't I be concerned? They, they, they are like, they are harassed and they are uh, helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Should I not be concerned? As I've said couple times before and this morning I want to just challenge you to make a list make a make a 10 most wanted list 10 10 people that you know God loves who don't know that who don't know him by the way your 10 your list of 10 are already on God's list of 10 I can guarantee that and I'd encourage you to put a few enemies on your list too, by the way. Don't just pray for people that, that are your friends and put a few enemies on there. Make your list. Pray daily for them. Build a relationship. Build some bridges of friendship with them. Listen and respect them. Don't judge them. Abide on the vine. Keep your own heart right through this time and God will produce the fruit through you. Obey and tell them about God's love. Let the Holy Spirit do the work and then be ready. Be ready to tell them how they are loved by God and how they can receive Christ. I included in your bulletin, what are you going to say to them? Well, one of the things I've used a lot is the, is the Roman road. That's real simple. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. 6.23, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Verses five, or chapter 5, verse 8, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And chapter 10, verses 9 and 13, that if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that God has raised him from the dead, we shall be saved. And verse 13, whosoever calls on the name of the Lord. Are there any whosoever's in this room tonight, this morning? Whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. I'm a whosoever. You are a whosoever. What about you this morning as I close? Have you been running and hiding from God's call and plan for your life? Maybe, maybe God is giving you another chance to surrender your life to him, to obey his call. Maybe here, maybe Trinity, maybe we're going through what we're going through. Maybe you're going through what you're going through because God wants us to see what his love can do. What God's love can do in us and especially through us. And I want to challenge you with that. 
I want to leave that challenge with you. Will you pray with me? Lord, this morning, as we draw this service to a close, I know your Holy Spirit's been speaking to all of us. Lord, this is a, this is a very important moment. A very important moment for someone. It's a very important moment for this congregation. Lord, we want to see what love can do in this place and through us into others. Lord, we're going to leave the judging up to you. We want love to win day after day after day. Lord, we want, we want to see these 10 on our list. We want to see what love can do in their lives. Thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayers this morning. Thank you for this example of Jonah. You got his attention and you turned him around and you gave him another chance. Lord, would you do that for us? Would you do that for Trinity? Would you do that here? Thank you, Lord, we pray. In the name of Jesus, amen. I invite you to stand for our benediction. But once again, as we close the service, that doesn't mean the service is closed. We're not stopping the Holy Spirit at all. I'm going to be down front here and some of the elders as well. Bishop Mel will be here. Be glad to pray with you. Time to stop running. Time to let the Lord have his way in us. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.